Welcome to Indigenous Earth, where we explore indigenous wisdom to help you protect and connect to our planet. From the Paitavdira tribe of Paraguay, I'm your host, Frank Oscar Weaver. As indigenous people, we have that view that everything is interrelated, everything is interconnected. Indigenous people, I feel, are thought leaders in this space because we have always held that perspective and that angle regardless of the dominating or the dominant worldview that might exist within the countries that we are in. Today we're going to be here from Beth to Paracatene. I'm from the east coast of the North Island in New Zealand, a little small town called Gisborne or Turanga Nui Akiwa. It's the first place to see the sun. And so we are known for our beaches. We are known for our connection to the ocean. For us here within New Zealand, or especially our Māori communities and, and our non-Māori communities, we have a strong connection because we've always gone to the ocean. Beth is going to share a little bit more about New Zealand and the original name. Māori people... Uh, the indigenous sort of Polynesian inhabitants of Aotearoa, New Zealand. So our name is Māori, our name for New Zealand is Aotearoa, which means the land of the long white cloud. And so when our ancestors first arrived here to this island in the middle of the big Pacific Ocean, that was the name that they gave New Zealand. We talk about sort of the long journeys, I suppose our ancestors when they travelled from the, the sort of central Pacific islands, navigating through the oceans, we ended up here in this little island of, of New Zealand. So it's, it's an interesting place in terms of climate. So it's not like the other Pacific islands where it's very warm. It can be very cold here. The sun rises and the sunsets are beautiful. But yes, very much an island that is very far away from from anyone else. It's a beautiful climate surrounded by the ocean. And I think in terms of our project and the focus of our project around the ocean, it just means so much to us because we are this little island in this huge ocean. And Beth, how would you describe your relation to the ocean? Because to me, when I hear you speak, it seems that the Maori have a really strong connection to the ocean, almost spiritual. Our connection with the ocean, and, and like you've sort of acknowledged, is very spiritual, it's cultural, and it's something that we engage with all the time because it's it's around us. And so in terms of sort of our way of, or our worldview, is that we talk about Tangaroa, who is, the way in which we say it is like an, an atua, or a, it's hard to put a English word to it, but the most sort of closest, I suppose, is we talk about the Māori god of the sea. Um, and so it's very central to our worldview. This tangaro represents the ocean, the life-giving and sustaining properties, and we honour and have a close connection with, with tangaro. But also within, within the realm of tangaro, there are a whole lot of other deities, etc., that sort of are associated with the oceans. So through our stories, through our culture, through our practices, we have a connection. And so we have a belief system that we are connected to the ocean through genealogy. And so therefore we have a responsibility or an obligation to ensure that, one, we look after and we sustainably use the gifts that sit, that are within the ocean. When we talk about here in New Zealand and our relationship or connection with the ocean, it is sort of all of that spiritual, cultural and practical because it is such a central part of who we are as a people. That's amazing to have such a strong relationship to the ocean. And can you tell me about your personal relationship to the ocean? It's there. It's for some, they live on like right next to the ocean. For others, it's a five minute drive or something like that. But it is very central. And it's interesting that you don't realize what you have until you don't have it. So it's very much a part of us. And so it wasn't until I actually moved away from Gisborne into the central part of, of New Zealand, into the North Island, that I realized just how much 
the ocean meant to me because there was no ocean we couldn't just cruise down to the beach and relax and sit on the sands and go for a swim all of those kinds of things so we have as memories so we would have family picnics there we would have christmas there we would it was just an everyday thing we knew where we were allowed to swim as well so that was something taught to us by our elders by my grandparents and stuff like that so you know you knew where you could and couldn't go because of the the different events or activities that had happened there so yeah I think for me in terms of my story around the ocean and my connection to the ocean is that it's always been there and sometimes have taken it for granted to tell you the truth for for me Personally, in terms of the area in which I was brought up with, we actually have a port that sits in the middle and creates a bit of a disconnect between our relationship that we have as a people, as an ocean people, to the ocean. Because there now is a big log, a port that does a lot of logging, so it does forestry and stuff like that. So there is a bit of a disconnect, but we are trying to pull that back and, and improve our relationship with that with the oceans. But yeah, I think for me it's just ingrained in who we are. It's around us. And so yeah, in terms of things we would do next to the ocean, it was just always there. And climate change is here. In Florida, for example, we are experiencing record high temperatures inland, in the ocean, we have flooding, we are having stronger hurricanes. So the planet is definitely changing. Have you seen in your perspective any changes to the ocean? There is a lot of change in terms of the way in which we are having a relationship with the ocean. And so we find it quite hard to look at, well, how do we start to have a relationship? There's a lot of depletion in terms of fish stocks due to overfishing, but due to climate change as well. So the waters are getting warmer. So the different species are turning up in different places. So all of those kinds of things that we as humans have an impact, well, we are impacting on the natural way of the ocean. We're needing to be a lot more cognizant of our impact. It's not saying stop everything and lock everything away there's definitely a time and a place for that but one of the big things that I've seen where you have locked stuff away here in, in New Zealand is that you create that disconnect and so you you lose the practices and the language that goes with having a connection with the ocean or even the land and so you start to lose those practices when you don't have a, a connection. So I think there's definitely, in terms of human impact, climate change is changing the way in which our oceans and our environment, gener uh, our environment generally is changing. Like those things are having an impact. I think the key thing for us as a people is to be better connected to our oceans and our land, to come up with solutions and ways to adapt these changes that we don't even know what types of impacts we're going to have and they're happening faster and faster is what we're seeing as well. Can you tell me more about your personal background and the project Tangaro Arao, how that came to be? My background is in sort of Maori environmental policy and over the years I've sort of worked in the area of, of oceans governance and environmental policy, working for government and also for Māori tribes and sub-tribes. So this research project is really sort of a what I've seen over the years working in this space. Tangaro Araro Research Project is an initiative focused on developing a comprehensive and culturally integrated approach to marine governance in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The project aims at placing Tangaroa or creating an ocean-centric governance regime that puts the ocean at the centre. It also is looking at how do we ensure that this new governance regime also provides for tikanga Māori or Māori customs and practices and upholds the agreements that were established under Te Tiriti or Waitangi, which was a a treaty signed between Māori and the British Crown back in 1840. So that's the crux 
of our research project. I'm the project lead for that project and have a team of us who have experiences across across governance, across management, policy and legislation in the marine and sort of treaty of Waitangi space. And we have all worked with our sort of tribes, our families and our sub-tribes, as well as what we call sort of pan iwi entities, which is collective of tribes coming together, as well as government and in the court. We've taken the approach of working with experts from across various fields, so it might be tikanga Māori, customary and commercial fishing, and also looking at what we call here the Marine and Coastal Areas Act, which is around the foreshore and seabed. And so there is a whole lot of sort of arrangements that exist within New Zealand that we have been a part of and it's been looking at how do we create systems change really is is what we're looking at. The current system that we have in in New Zealand is one that is designed for extraction and utilisation and profit ultimately and we're looking at how do we look at changing a system that puts the ocean and the health and well-being of the ocean first with a priority second going back to the sustenance and feeding of our people. And then third, the whole obligation around other activities such as commercial, cultural and social well-being activities. So that our project and looking at what are those changes that would need to happen for us to achieve that vision of a more ocean-centric or tangaroa at the heart of decision-making type of governance regime. That is amazing. How do you even start to make that shift to move from that extractive type of mentality to a more balanced type of approach? Hmm. To be able to make that shift from the current regime that we have, which is very Western, and the way it's been designed. It is what it is at the end of the day. But when we think about all the challenges that we're having um, <clears throat> around um, climate change, people looking for answers, and, 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 and there's been a lot of narrative around we need to be more holistic, we need to be more integrated and looking for solutions. From my perspective, our Indigenous people are the ones that hold that type of knowledge and way of actually being holistic in the approach that they have or the relationship that they have with the ocean. And so we're very much around, as Indigenous people, we have that view that everything is interrelated, everything is interconnected. And so when we compare that to a Western way of looking at the world, it it is quite different. And so for me, in terms of encouraging, I suppose, another way of another system, then the Indigenous people, I feel, have got uh, are thought leaders in this space because we have always held that perspective and that angle regardless of the dominating or the dominant worldview that might exist within the countries that we are in. Any governance regime that we do create with the heart or the centre being the ocean, then the people then other activities will take time to transition into. And there are a whole lot of cogs and different parts that will need to adjust. And so this isn't going to be a a change that happens overnight. But I think there are definitely things that we can be doing that can start to shift that dial towards a more ocean-centric way of, or system that we have. And the first the first one and the easiest one is around that vision and then getting agreement from nations around that vision. And yes, that's going to probably take time, but there's also opportunity to embed that in national direction. And so that's one of our areas in which we focus in on around how do we make that change. So how do we embed a vision which puts tangaroa or puts the ocean at the centre? That is something that needs to be embedded here in New Zealand anyway at a national legislative level so that everything from there then trickles down. The other thing that's important and I think is a first key step as we start to move into how do we make that transition 
is around the principles. And so being guided by a set of principles that are aligned with tikanga from our, our point of view or our way of doing things, but are also very beneficial for others as well. Hey, this is Frank. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Beth. Before we share the design principles of the Tangaroa Ararao, I want to tell you a quick story. Recently, I was traveling and visited the Navajo Nation capital of Window Rock. I was seeing my friends Zuniba and Nate. We sat down to eat some yummy Navajo tacos when two stray dogs, known as Res Dogs, showed up. They were hungry and in need. It was amazing to see Zuniba and Nate so well prepared with because they had dog food and water bowls in their car. We explored Window Rock and I learned so much about the Navajo code talkers with Nate, Zuniba, and the two dogs. It was an unforgettable experience. But did you know that Zuniba and her family helped many other rescue animals in the Navajo Nation? They covered vet bills, dog food, dog toys, everything, and mostly out of their own pockets. So if you can help, please check out Res Animal Protectors on Facebook. They have an Amazon wish list where you can support the animals directly. Every little bit help. Trust me. Now, let's go back to our conversation with Beth as she shares the design principles of the Tangaro Ararao project. And so that comes through in terms of looking at the Nga Pai Moana that we have developed as a part of our, our research project. And so we have designed a set of principles that look at systemic change. And so those have been, the key one here is around what we, we, ha, we call tātai hono, but that is very much around acknowledging the importance and the interconnectedness of humans and the marine environment. And that, that sort of tangible sense of obligation through our concept of shared genealogy, or what we call whakapapa, between the people and the ocean. So that's fundamentally the, the key sort of principle when we think about that connection and the importance of having that. The other one that we have within our Ngā Pai Moana is what we call to utu utu. So it's the duty of care and reciprocity. So reciprocity underpinning all interactions with the ocean, between people within an ocean context. And again, it's that sense of obligation that we look after the ocean, the ocean will look after us. The third Ngā Pai Moana or principle that we've, we've developed has been around the acknowledgement of the ocean's pivotal role in driving our well-being and economic prosperity. So we still need to have be able to utilise the ocean to create economic return but we need to ensure that the health and well-being of the ocean is paramount. And so being able to derive prosperity in a whole sort of multifaceted way, including community well-being, sustenance, economic success and environmental balance. So trying to look at those things. Another key one for here in New Zealand specifically, and probably for other Indigenous groups as well, is what we call mana. And so what we mean by that here is the enablement of self-determination and authority to the Indigenous people through the devolution of decision-making powers back to the people. And so, yeah, we within our Te Tiriti o Waitangi, there were agreements made that as Māori we would have rangatiratanga or self-determination over our, our taonga or our natural resources. Uh, that is something that we continue to discuss or robustly debate with our government here in New Zealand around how do we fulfil those promises that were made within Te Tiriti o Waitangi back in 1840. And then the other two that we have there is what we call Tauriti, but what that is about is around the acknowledgement of or recognition and value of our knowledge systems as Māori and our practices and protocols. So often what we've seen is that the Western science or other knowledge is provided more recognition and value in comparison to sort of Māori knowledge systems. And often Indigenous 
knowledge systems are framed in a way that that put it in the traditional box or the box of things that used to be relevant. And so some of that too is that we're needing to change that, is that we have a knowledge system as an Indigenous people that is just as relevant today as it was in days gone by. And so being able to have our knowledge considered and recognised at the same level as other, other knowledge. And then the last one is what we have called Tuipoto, which is very much around systems are informed by and deferred to people at place. So acknowledging and empowering localised solutions driven by those place-based knowledge um, systems that are at that local level. Six sort of principles that we would look to embed in any sort of national framework. They might not be specifically those as such, but those are the elements that we would look to ensure are embedded in any system we were looking at shifting from the current regime into a more ocean-centric regime. Thank you so much, Beth. Those are amazing principles. And for those listening at home, I'm going to make sure to put all the different principles in our show descriptions. Also, you can visit indigenousearth.org to get any more information. And I'm also going to add Beth's project into those show descriptions. So that way you can kind of go back to it and reference. And Beth, um, how can we put these principles into our daily lives? Because they are very well defined. And I believe that it's really going to help people that are listening at home to have a stronger connection to our planet and being able to help. I think in terms of individually, as a person going to the beach, For example, and you see rubbish that's on the beach, pick it up and put it in the bin. It's that that simple. If I'm a commercial operator as a fisher, as a fisherman, and knowing what our the stock that you're taking or the fish that you're taking, and understanding whether there is enough in there to look after for the speed loss. I'm gonna say that one again. So as a commercial fisher knowing what types of species you are catching and ensuring that there is, that you have the data and evidence that that species can be can, can continue to be fished in the way that you're fishing it. I would say from a commercial fishing point of view, from a customary fishing point of view, I would say to take fish or shellfish and just enough to be able to feed your family for one meal or maybe two meals, but don't overdo it. (laughs) That's awesome. So basically, Tao Tutu? Yes, is the duty of care and reciprocity. So very much associated with the first principle, Ta Te Hono. It is about that reciprocity. So everything that we do is about looking after and then giving back. So if we look after Tangaroa or the ocean, the ocean will look after us. And we have an obligation to do that because it is, yeah, it's that obligation of reciprocity. I love that so much. And you can expand a little bit more about that. Yes. I think um, similar to Tātai Hono in, in terms of being able to to look after, again, it's, it's, it's looking at it from an individual perspective, I think around thinking about whenever you are doing something, and you're connected, you think about the ocean first. So one thing, for example, in our practices or customs is whenever we go fishing, the first fish goes back to Tangaroa. So whenever we catch a fish, the first one goes back to Tangaroa, that's to acknowledge or and to respect and thank Tangaroa for that catch. And then from there, our custom or our belief is that we can then continue to fish in a way. So that's an example of what we do practically here within our, within here in Aotearoa as Māori, is our first fish, uh, well, our first catch goes back to Tangaroa. So that is a practice of reciprocity that we have. I love that. It reminds me of a conversation from a Hawaiian elder about the water cycle. He explained that one third of the water from the sky evaporates. 
another third goes in the mountains. And finally, that third flows into the river for us to drink. So when we talk about giving back to nature, it's not about returning that one part that we took, but offering the entirety of what we receive, because that's what nature truly requires. Yes, and that, that's it. That, that's the key. And because a lot of the impact on the ocean comes from the land, so the intensification of the land then runs off into the water, like you were saying, in terms of the quality of the, the water in the ocean. And so, yes, it, it's, it's all connected in terms of the impact that we have on the, the land. So even though we might talk about the ocean specifically, there is impacts on that we have as humans on the land that is negatively impacting on the ocean and the, wa- the quality of the water. And so when, again, we think about your question just around how do we give back, it's, it's being more cognizant of the impact that we're having on the land as well, whether that's individually, commercially, or just even as a way in which to sustain ourselves or to feed our people. So the project is coming to an end after many years of hard work from you and your team. How does it feel? And what do you hope the impact will be? Yes, it has been great to be able to get to this point where we can share our research and our findings and look at tangibly finding practical ways to make the shifts that we've identified. And so one of those things in terms of helping shift, especially when you're working within a policy and legislation space, nothing is black and white. It's very politically driven. And so anything to do with providing, especially Maori rights and interests, often come with the political challenges. And so as a research team that is on the ground with our people, in the courts with our people, it is great to be able to come to a point where we are going, well, here could be a way in which we shift the dial. It's not going to provide all the answers or the solutions because that is something that needs to be done with the people, both Māori as the indigenous people of Aotearoa and also non-Māori as well. And so what we hope with our research is that this will be able to be used as a sounding board, provide ideas and thought leadership into this new place or this new sort of future that we're moving into. One of the intentions of our research was always around looking at how do we move the hearts and minds of New Zealand to move from the current system that we're in into a new governance, marine governance regime that puts the ocean at the centre. And we, I acknowledge that there is some awesome steps being made towards that sort of idea. And one of the things that we are looking at doing to help shift hearts and minds is holding an art exhibition. So one of the ways that traditionally and still today, Māori would transfer knowledge or disseminate information was through our arts, so through our carvings, through our stories, our pūrāko, through our whakapapa, our genealogy, through waiata, our songs, through proverbs or whakatauki. So there are different ways that we would orally transfer or visually transfer information. And so a part, a key component, part of our research project was to do exactly that. So we will be holding a art exhibition at the end of this month as sort of a wrap up to our research project that we will look to what we have. We've got artists at the moment that have that we have shared our findings so far with them and they are now developing art pieces to be a part of the art exhibition. We also have a song being written for our research project as well and we're also looking at how do we share that so that will and we've also just last week actually finished filming um, a video to be a part of that exhibition so when I think about sort of where we have come from and where we are now it's exciting it's exciting to be able to share with people where we are at 
But one of the things is there is still a lot of work, still a lot of work to be done. But when I sort of look at breaking it down, there are some key things and reasonably easy things, some might say, to shift that dial to become more ocean centric. And I think that's the key thing is that if we can promote that idea, provide thoughts and ideas on how we might get there, I think that this project would have helped to shift the dial a little bit more. And like I say, it's not going to have all the answers, but I hope that it will help spark and help encourage people to have a better relationship with the ocean. I think if there's one thing here, generally speaking, that people can take away is to be present when you go down to the ocean or also to think about your footprint and the impact of your footprint on the land and the impact that it has. All of those kinds of things will help us shift towards being more present, more aligned with our environment. And all that we're doing in this research project is trying to help sort of with the the policy and the just a little regime to help shift that. But I think individually we all have a responsibility in terms of giving back so that we can ensure for ourselves and for future generations there is that connection. Because with that, with our land, with our oceans, there's a well-being that comes with that for both sides. I think that's the important thing is that we're shifting the hearts and minds of people to take a more ocean-centric approach to our relationship with the ocean. Thank you so much. This is such an inspiring project. And to me, it's phenomenal that you're creating this storytelling based on your findings. You're creating songs, you're creating dance, you're creating carvings, all this traditional way of passing down information and you know sitting down talking to me that's that's part of it so i just want to say how uh, inspiring i am and i am very thankful for you sharing these stories with us yes yes absolutely yeah thank you so much once again to you to your team to victoria everyone that work in this project so inspiring do you have any departing word for us yeah i think the main thing is around that vision around how do we put the ocean at the centre of everything that we do. Whether you're an individual, whether you're a business owner, whether you're a, a, a customary fisher, I think having that vision of having a system that allows the centre to be the ocean. And all decisions that we make is based on the health and well-being of the ocean. The second thing for me there is around the priority to the being able to feed our people, to sustain our people, to be able to feed them, to be able to look after them. I think those two things, if we look at it, are, are the critical parts to all of this. And yes, structures, systems and processes will fall out of that. But I think for us here in Aotearoa, but for other nations, having an ocean-centric approach to the way we make decisions about the way in, in which people have a relationship with the ocean is critical. Here in, in Aotearoa, we, we, we move away from the, or as Māori, about managing the ocean. It's not so much that. It's the way in which people are managed or the way in which we govern ourselves uh, in our relationship with the ocean. And it's those little nuances that need to be changed the way that are changed in the way that we think about the ocean. So one, the ocean should be the center of all our decisions. The second thing is around ensuring that we have sustenance and able to feed our families. And, and I think those are the, the sort of key takeaways that I think for, for any nation yeah, from this project that people could take away with them. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoy the conversation I had with Beth and Tangaro Arao. There's so much more to learn from this project. I feel like I have to make another episode to go in depth with the second half of that conversation we had with Beth. So stay tuned for that. Meanwhile, please check out their website. Very extensive, a lot of information. 
You can also go to indigenousearth.org for more info or check out the show descriptions. Thank you so much for being here with me. I really appreciate it. Aguje. Yeah, 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 yeah